Today, I would like to introduce Pamela McCordock as the, as the first speaker of our lecture series, Thinking Machines. Uh, Pamela is a US American and a journalist. She completed her undergraduate studies in, at the University of California, Berkeley, and then went to the Columbia University in New York, where she earned a Master of Fine Arts degree. She is known for her books on artificial intelligence, and I posted some of these books here on this transparency. Uh, with Nancy Ramsey, in particular, she wrote a book about women in computer science, which resulted in a two-part television documentary on CNN. She was co-author of Edward Feigenbaum, and she wrote an art, uh, on art and computer science. She also wrote novels about this strange group of people in the sciences, especially related to the Santa Fe Institute, with which she is associated. She has written for magazines and newspapers, including Cosmopolitan and the New York Times. And she was a former, uh, she is a former vice president of the Pan American Center and co-founder um, of this collection uh, of a lot of calculation machines, letters and books on um, computer sciences. Her latest book um, was two years ago. It appeared uh, two years ago, this could be important by life and times with the artificial intelligentsia. And um, I would like to uh, mention that um, I saw this book in, that was written in 1979, Machines Who Think, uh, after uh, Pamela did a lot of interviews with people from uh, with pioneers of AI, Marvin Minsky, Herbert Simon, Alan Newell, and Lot Fizade included. And Lot Fizade was uh, the pioneer of my book in 2004. So when I saw this book and I saw this picture, there is uh, McCarthy and uh, Dreyfus in, in the middle. This is Lord Fizadi is moderating a um, kind of discussion, a panel discussion. So I asked Pamela uh, via email in that time uh, whether I can have this picture in my book and she allowed me to do that. And then many years later, um, I was in Lord Fizadi's house and I was collecting all the material um, and I found this advertisement uh, for the book of Pamela uh, with this very nice uh, photograph of Pamela in that time. So this is um, my introduction to Pamela McCordock and the floor is yours, Pamela. Thank you very much. Uh, Grüß Gott, <laughs> guten Tag and good morning from California. We are uh, not quite to our orange juice yet, and you are, of course, thinking about your Abend beer. I'm going to be talking about early AI in the United States. Will you will you um, share the screen, please? I, I thought I did, but obviously no. Great. Yep. It works, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Uh, it seems to me that the best way to think about early AI in the United States is to think about it in terms of generations. Now, why am I not? Okay. Um, four generation, well, three generations here. The godfather is his own place. The forefathers who were active in the 1940s, uh, these were scientists who had ideas which were rich in possibilities, but impossible to test or realize um, because of the technology limits of the time. The next, the founding fathers, who in the mid 1950s brought to AI research, not only innovative ideas, but who also had access to the best computers of the time. 
that access allowed them to test and realize some of the conjectures of their intellectual forefathers, but also to test original ideas of their own. Uh, the great advantage of having executable code led to real scientific breakthroughs on the one hand and abandoned conjectures on the other. Uh, I'd like to mention two members of the second generation whose mid 1960s work was fundamental, but above all, no use to talk about early AI in the United States without mentioning another kind of father of all this, uh, a godfather figure who made sure AI was fully financially supported as it was lurching to life. Post-war science in the United States was an intoxicating time. Uh, Post-war prosperity, maturing electronic technologies, unusually brilliant personalities led to great breakthroughs uh, in AI. This was a time of major intellectual turbulence, a bubbling and eddying of ideas from every side competing, stretching, merging with each other in ways that could possibly be described by some aspects of the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, possibly not. It was grand to be young and alive. Much of that turbulence was taking place in reaction to prevailing ideas of cognitive psychology. Think of the surf bashing against an immovable stone seawall. That immovable stone seawall was behavioral psychology led by B.F. Skinner. Skinner held that the mind was a black box. We could never know what was going on inside skulls. In those days, we were uh, sure all cognition took place inside the skull. We, all we could be sure of was how that brain behaved in response to stimuli. Uh, therefore, the proper study of mind was to stimulate and see how the creature responded. Skinner was skeptical of the idea of human memory. He barely tolerated the idea of human emotions. All were mere illusions. Mind, he believed, was a pre-scientific superstition, impossible to study empirically. A Skinner lacked the humility to admit that if the interior of the human skull was unknowable then, it, may, it might someday be known. No, for him, it was case closed. And believe it or not, one of my acquaintances learned this stuff when he was a graduate student. But the dogmas of behaviorism failed to convince a few uh, rebel scientists, and these were the forefathers. Uh, for example, I will let you look at them, I'll speak about each of them. Claude Shannon, uh, well known for his ideas on information theory, though the term is more accurately communications theory. He and my husband, Joseph F. Straub, once had a discussion of these two terms, I was with them. Uh, and Shannon agreed that communications theory was a more accurate term than information theory. Let's start a campaign to change the name, he joked, but of course it was far too late. Uh, Shannon presented information theory in his 1937 master's thesis using Boolean algebra to address the questions of how many messages could be conveyed through the telephone line, not the information that these messages contained. But if Boolean algebra could describe the laws of electronic circuits, could it also describe the laws of thought? Shannon was intrigued by the question over the decades and approached it in various ways, though he never succeeded in writing a program to instantiate his ideas. Um, for all his scientific rigor and brilliance, he was a whimsical man. One Christmas, his wife bought him a unicycle 
and he loved to ride it through the halls of MIT, juggling balls as he rode. Rumor said he was very successful in the stock market. And one afternoon, as I was interviewing him, he interrupted our conversations to take a long call from the stockbroker. When he returned to me, I felt bold enough to uh, say that he had a reputation for having had great success in the stock market. Yes, you could say that, he smiled. Another man dissatisfied with behavior psychology was Norbert Wiener. I'm giving him the pronunciation that uh, Americans give and that he used. He was a mathematician at MIT when MIT was considered an intellectual backwater. He'd earned his PhD at 18. He went first to England to study logic with Bertrand Russell and then to Germany to study with David Hilbert. In 1920, he ended up at MIT where, as I said, his mathematics department had no particular distinction. Fortunately, he, his department, and his institution grew in prestige over the next few decades until all three achieved worldwide eminence. Wiener became fascinated, perhaps obsessed, with the notion of feedback early in his career. Along with Claude Shannon's ideas of information theory and its terms, such as coding, storage, and noise, Wiener thought feedback was a much richer way to account for a whole host of events from the behavior of electronic circuits to the behavior of a replicating cell. In 1943, he co-authored scientific papers uh, comparing the digital computer to the nervous system. After the war, again with MIT colleagues, he devised a model of the central nervous system. His 1948 book, Cybernetics, a term he coined, which gave us all those cyber something or others, uh, explicitly marks the switch from energy as the dominant model of phenomena to information instead. Though the first edition of that book has only one chapter devoted to computers. Uh, Wiener attempted to compare the all or none aspects of the neuron with the all or none aspects of the computer and the logic of the, of the computer with the logic of the brain. And in those days, it was all worry, you know, colored by worries about machine reliability. He even noted that a chess playing program might be possible. And since Wiener was one of the few Americans who had conversations with Alan Turing after the war, we can't be sure who originated the idea. Paradoxically, Wiener played ridiculously bad chess. He challenged other MIT professors in the faculty club and almost always lose. The trouble with chess, he complained, is that you mustn't make any mistakes. He had splendid plans, he thought, for how to take his opponent's pieces away, get his king. But early in the game, Wiener would always make a mistake and lose his queen so he could never carry out these grand plans. Wiener was not only influenced by Claude Shannon's ideas, he was influenced by the work of Warren McCulloch, a neurophysiologist fascinated by the activity of the brain. McCulloch and the young mathematician and high school dropout, Walter Pitts, in 1943, proposed a new mathematical uh, definition of computing machine, which allowed the brain to be construed as a machine in a more precise way. Um, they called it a neural net. The laws governing mind should be sought among the laws governing information rather than energy or matter. That paper also focused on the remaining problems uh, 
the, no the knowledge is complex, the neurons of the brains are relatively simple, though not as simple as was then believed, and the interactions between those two remain to be described. No one was more aware of the limitations of what he could describe than McCulloch. Don't bite my finger, he would say habitually. Look where I'm pointing. Neural nets would languish for many decades until new knowledge about the neuron and dramatically better technology would revive neural nets as a significant part of AI research. McCulloch also eventually moved from the University of Illinois to MIT, where he exchanged ideas with Wiener, Shannon, and von Neumann in a group they call the Teleological Society. The final forefather of AI was John von Neumann, the eminent mathematician who met, met computers during World War II and believed computing would be essential to science and mathematics in the future. Yes, indeed. Very early, he drew parallels between the operations of a high-speed computer and the human nervous system. He used terms such as memory and control organs and declared confidently that specific parts of these new machines corresponded to neural activity in the human nervous system. Computers as thinking machines fascinated him, but by 1951, he doubted the connection between machine and brain could be made. Preparing for a series of lectures at Yale University, he was stricken with cancer and died in early 1957 at the age of 54. His incomplete lectures were again about the computer and the brain, though with the emphasis on the two sets of hardware, not their functional similarities. These lectures are gener generally regarded as the precursors to the field of cellular automata, a field von Neumann invented with his friend Stanislaw Ullmann during their collaborations at Los Alamos in the 1940s. People who knew von Neumann were always astounded by his intellectual breadth and depth. It didn't always take highfalutin forms. Leon Harmon told me that when he and von Neumann worked together, they began a competition to see who could invent the cleverest, dirtiest limericks possible. Harmon told me, whenever we saw each other, whether it was a day or a week or months later, the name of the game was to see who could rush up the fastest and unload the largest number of limericks. It turned out to be a delightful game. He had oodles of them. I was hard put to keep up with him. His memory was just beyond conception. A photograph for everything he ever learned or saw. Lightning calculator and head screwed on to boot. He put all those together with a huge creative talent. Uh, the next generation, well, let me say furthermore, these forefathers of AI, stymied by the state of computing, neurophysiology, cognitive psychology, and sometimes their own misapprehensions, they didn't succeed in realizing artificial intelligence, but they did succeed in demolishing behaviorism, and they mentored the next generation suggesting ways to achieve AI when the time would come. So the next generation is generally known as the founding fathers of AI. They had connections with each of the forefathers. For example, uh, Marvin Minsky was deeply influenced by McCulloch and Pitt's ideas of neural nets. But he couldn't make his neural net models work in any way that resembled intelligence. He told me, it took me a long time to switch from trying to understand how the brain works to understanding what it does. In particular, to try and make up theories of how any kind of thinking machine might work. But McCulloch had given Minsky faith, he says, that the thinking machine problem could be solved. 
Minsky realized he simply needed a different, a better approach. One of those approaches took the form of a brief romance with perceptrons, but Minsky abandoned that work too. He told me he was always very happy to abandon approaches that didn't work. Science should be fun, and it wasn't fun to work on dead ends. In the 1970s, he was enjoying musical composition so much that he thought of giving up AI research. Luckily, he did not. John McCarthy, as an undergraduate at Caltech in 1948, heard John von Neumann give a lecture on machine intelligence and was captivated. He wanted to create intelligence in machines, even if von Neumann had believed it was impossible. Later, as a young assistant professor of mathematics at Dartmouth College, uh, he traveled across New Hampshire uh, to Massachusetts to see his friend Marvin Minsky, where they could discuss ways of creating machine intelligence. Not very productive talks, he told me much later, other than to establish that we were in fact allies on the subject and that we agreed on a number of things. But I don't think Minsky and I changed each other's ideas much in the areas where we didn't agree. But in the areas where we did, we reinforced each other. Perhaps more important, McCarthy had conceived and was trying to implement time sharing on the computer. Computer usage then was generally batch processing. Users were pushed into sequential opportunities at the computer and sometimes had to wait hours, even days, to discover if their program had run successfully. McCarthy wanted to build programs in a way that would become the de facto method of software engineering in the future. Build a little, test a little, build a little more, test a little again. It sounds hard to believe now, but he and his idea of time sharing were bitterly opposed by people who believed you should think it through ahead of time and get it right the first time. McCarthy and Minsky decided it would be useful to have a summer workshop on machine intelligence. And they enlisted uh, Claude Shannon then at Bell Labs in New Jersey to put his name on the proposal along with Nathaniel Rochester, an IBM scientist who also showed interest in machine intelligence. McCarthy told me, I believed if only we could get everyone who is interested in the subject together to devote time to it and avoid distractions, we could make real progress. Thus was born the Dartmouth Conference held in the summer of 1956. In the proposal that McCarthy wrote for the Rockefeller Foundation, it seems he first coined the phrase artificial intelligence. I just didn't want to read more papers about automata theory, he said. The Dartmouth conference made that phrase dominate the others, though of course not to everybody's satisfaction. The conference included mathematicians, psychologists, and engineers, but they all shared a common belief that what we call thinking could indeed take place outside the human cranium, that it could be understood in a formal and scientific way and the best instrument for all this was the computer. Uh, truthfully, the concrete results of the conference were sparse. Marvin Minsky toyed with a geometry proving program and wrote the first drafts of what would come to be known as a seminal paper, Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence. He was also eager to pursue neural nets. John McCarthy was thinking of a chess playing program in addition, he told the funders it would, be, it would be desirable to construct an artificial language which a computer can use on problems requiring conjecture and self-reference. As you know, he took a look at the Lisp processing language Newell and Simon had invented, IPL5, and decided to clean it up, make it more elegant and useful. It became Lisp, the language of AI for many years to come. But two scientists invited almost as an afterthought that summer, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, based at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
arrived with a working and genuinely intelligent program that proved theorems in Whitehead and Russell's Principia Mathematica. It was called the logic theorist and is generally regarded as the first AI program. It avoided low level logic and neural nets and worked instead at a mid-level point of cognition, what Newell and Simon called the information processing level. Uh, their work was certainly received with interest, but it seems that nobody but Newell and Simon themselves sensed the long range significance of what they were doing. It took five years for Minsky to add a large section on Newell and Simon's work to his hardy perennial of a paper, Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence, which he handed over to two of Simon's former uh, students. They were putting together the first collection of readings about working AI programs. Uh, the collection is dominated by the Newell-Simon method, even those from MIT written under Minsky's supervision. The 1961 book was called Computers and Thought, edited by Edward Feigenbaum and Julian Feldman. I was the gopher on that book. Do you have that word in German? Gopher? Dog's body? Somebody who goes for everything, does all the scut work. Yeah, that was me. Uh, it was my introduction to AI, a field that would preoccupy me the rest of my life. Two intellectual sons of the founding fathers deserve mention. First, Edward Feigenbaum, a student of Herb Simon. His program called Dendral changed the usual paradigm of AI, which had emphasized reasoning to a paradigm that emphasized knowledge instead. Yes, you need reasoning to act intelligently, but it emerges that you can't do much of anything without deep factual and operational knowledge around your problem. In, a, in AI, uh, knowledge goes without saying, whether it's force fed to the program by humans or teaches itself. Uh, Feigenbaum became and remains one of my best and oldest friends. The other second generation AI member I want to mention is Raj Reddy, an intellectual son of John McCarthy, whose Blackboard model with its data structure, expert contributions and a control structure now underlies so many working AI programs. I met Raj when he was a famished graduate student at Stanford, got reacquainted uh, when my husband became head of the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where Raj was then a young faculty member. And we too have remained friends all these years. Uh, as you see, Raj Reddy and Ed Feigenbaum shared the Turing Award in, in 1994. A Soviet scientist once asked Ed Feigenbaum, who allows you to do AI? The answer to that is the godfather I mentioned. He was JCR Licklider. Lick, as he always preferred to be known, had begun as a behavioral psychologist, most interested in auditory issues. How did the brain listen to sound waves and convert them into symbols? Uh, one of his tasks late in World War II was redesigning the cockpits of airplanes so that the noise in them was lessened and pilots could hear what they needed to hear. He also believed that behaviorist psychology, Skinner's style, was ridiculous, and he was eager to find a better scientific approach to cognition. Working at the Lincoln Labs adjacent to MIT, he was well aware of what our AI founding fathers were up to. In a 1960 paper called Man-Computer Symbiosis, he laid out a vision of a fully computerized world, integrating and synthesizing many of the ideas floating around AI, including the value of time sharing. The vision in that 1960 paper would lay out a roadmap for computing research for the next quarter century and more. The computer 
not a mere tool, but a kind of colleague whose competence would supplement human competences, each doing what it did best. Moreover, humans and machines would connect on a continental scale. In, these, in those days, you couldn't connect two computers in the same room. His 1960 insights into the nature of dynamic models were revolutionary and are fundamental to this day. He furthermore recognized that such models could be shared among scientists, not reside in the head of a single researcher. Licklider's 1960 paper would bring him to the attention of the US Defense Department, where in the 1960s and again in the 1970s, he'd had a small research funding group inside the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, later known as DARPA, where he could dole out money, no questions asked, to support these researchers whose work promised to bring his singular vision into reality. AI, time sharing, networking, the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet. In other words, a way to make computers important in our everyday lives. He was the most visionary of godfathers and AI as we know it wouldn't have happened when it did without him. So forefathers, founding fathers, next generation sons, and a benevolent godfather to make it all happen. The world was fortunate indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Pamela. Thank you all for this nice talk. Yeah, we will have a next talk in two weeks with Stephanie Dick from the University of Pennsylvania and the title of the talk is Making Up Minds. Um, and I hope we will see, yeah, we don't see you, but I hope we will see your names in the participants list uh, in two weeks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for listening patiently. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Ciao. <laughs> Cześć. Cześć.